Um, tonight we have Nicole Wilker who's going to do it. Um, so we're very excited, woohoo, and she'll be doing that just right after the announcements and prior to when uh, Johanna um, does her presentation. Um, let's see, so what else? Recording, we are recording this meetup. So if that doesn't make you feel comfortable, please change your picture to like a monkey or something and then change your name. Um, you can all put Marie Struckman or Nancy Fowler. <laughs> you know, pick a name, pick somebody else's name. But um, you know, if that doesn't make you feel comfortable, then you know, feel free to take an action or two. But this it will be recorded. And then we end up putting this recording um, at the end of the month. This goes out on the Agile Denver website. Um, well, there's a link there, but it's actually Agile Denver YouTube. So they have a, a channel now and all the Agile Denver meetups that occurred during the month, they are recorded and then put up on the YouTube channel. So it's really great if you miss one or you just, you know, you get home and you think I can't do this tonight. Um, you know, you can probably, you can pick it up at the end of the month. So, and they'll be out there for a while. What else? Our sponsors. Um, we have Agile Denver as a sponsor. They've taken care of our meetup cost as well as uh, providing this wonderful Zoom Pro account, which is great. Do we have anybody from Agile Denver board on board? Get it? Uh -huh. yeah. No, okay. Sometimes they, they get to show up, um, that's, so that's cool. We also have Scrum Alliance. Um, Scrum Alliance, normally, you know, if it wasn't, pre-COVID, I used to say normally, but now like after COVID, we'll go back to Scrum Alliance. That's where our location is. Um, it's a great location. We certainly enjoy being in person and look forward to getting back there. So they always provide a wonderful location as well as um, some food and beverages. So we have somebody here from Scrum Alliance, Teddy. Anything you wanna share about, any news about Scrum Alliance or anything you wanna share here as a sponsor? Um. <clears throat> Well, I hope you all had a chance to uh, check out the 20th anniversary celebration of the Agile Manifesto that we helped uh, put on with Utah Agile that was on uh, LinkedIn today. It was a really good time. We had seven of the original signatories uh, participate uh, wow. in, in the event. It was really great. Um, <clears throat> if you don't know anything about uh, Scrum Alliance, we are the largest Scrum certification uh, body in the world. We are also the only nonprofit uh, certification body, meaning that all of your certification uh, fees and renewals go back into the community and not into someone's pocket. Uh, if you want to learn more, go to scrumalliance.org. Uh, if you are already a certificate, make sure you check out your um, dashboard every once in a while, your profile, uh, to keep up with the new uh, value-added uh, features and products that we drop in from time to time. And also and that, to, to log the SDUs, correct? Yes, uh, yes, for which you uh, can get to just for sitting here this evening and participating uh, in this event. Yeah. Great. Sales pitch Thanks. over. <laughs> Thanks, Teddy. Um, we sure certainly thing. appreciate uh, Scrum Alliance. Um, okay, what else? So normally we go through a bunch of other questions and um, instead we've created a, an FAQ. So things like, well, how do we get those SEUs? Where do we go? And, you know, um, you know, where do I find this meetup recording? And, uh, you know, what if I have a general question for the Agile community? What if I'm looking for a job, et cetera? Um, so I'm going to put a link in the chat channel right now. This link, I think right now, hold on, wait for it. Um, this link just goes to the FAQ and there's a bunch of information there. So I will, hold on for a second, copy it in there. We'll probably put it in there again. That's our FAQ. So the normal announcements are actually sitting in there, there and you can read them at your leisure. Please just you know link it or download it or something so that you have it. Um, let's see, uh, I guess, Johanna, I've got a question for you. During your presentation, um, how would you like to handle questions? So I would actually like questions as they come in. Okay. So you, I, wait. I will try and look at the chat and um, Marie and Nancy, if you, mm -hmm. if you see, I'm ignoring the chat. Um, okay. Break in. Tell me, right. Johanna. Okay. <laughs> we'll go. Yeah. Woo, woo. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So if, so folks, if you have a question, please put it in the chat and then we'll make sure that um, we draw that 
question to Johanna's attention. That work? Perfect. Okay, um, let's see the next meetup, February, Agile Denver North. I don't have the title, unfortunately, at the moment, but we have Christine, Christine Mac Mac Lamore, who's always a fun speaker to have around. Um, how about Agile Boulder? What do you got going on at your next yeah. one? We are uh, gearing up. We didn't. We haven't had one for a while, the holidays and all that good stuff. So um, our first one for the year will be February 24th at six o'clock. And we're actually going to start with a lean coffee so we can, we, we can ha have a better understanding as to what you all and the mem other members want to see and would like to talk about. So we want to gather. That's going to be an evening for just discussing general topics and gathering ideas for speakers and presentations. So it would be great to have your input at that, at that meetup. And then uh, we are looking for speakers. I have a few lined up, um, not scheduled yet, but um, please reach out to me or go to the Agile Boulder meetup site if you're interested and you can message me and we'll get you, get you on the schedule. Same here, by the way, too. Um, I've got some, I got the next couple months covered, but yeah, if someone's looking for the opportunity, that'd be great. Um, okay, so announcements are now aside. Let's go to Nicole. So we are going to do our, uh, a five minute lightning talk for those that don't know what a lightning talk is. It's just a, it's basically a five minute presentation um, on any topic that you that you want to present on, um, the whole point is just to have that experience to stand up in front of a group of people right now on Zoom um, and have the opportunity to present and, and just kind of polish those skill sets. So without I'm further standing. ado, <laughs> Nicole. All right. Hi. All right. Share my screen. <clears throat> All right. Hi everybody, my name is Nicole Wilker and um, I would like to talk to you about your personal Agile toolbox and how to fill it up. So um, I am certified, I'm SPC, um, Agile Alliance. I am married to a wonderful man for 15 years. We have two fur babies who are right behind me and hopefully will stay quiet for the whole time. Um, they are, you know, unconditional love and it's uh, just makes every day better. All right. <clears throat> Your Agile Toolbox. So um, I came to these this idea that um, you fill up your Agile Toolbox throughout your life. It doesn't have to be when you learned what the word Scrum or Agile or Safe or Agile Alliance or any of these words. It started way back when as you move through your life and learned things and did things. Um, sometimes it can be really organized, like the one on the left. Sometimes things just get thrown in and you pull out what you need, hopefully when you can find it and need it. Um, so you fill up this toolbox uh, using your skills, tips you might find on other meetups, thing, talents that you had, maybe you did dance as a small child, any sporting things you learned, uh, maybe hobbies that you had, interest, expertise, previous jobs. Anything fills up your toolbox and you pull out what you need when you need it. So I came to the conclusion that way back when, when I used to teach aerobics, that this was actually where I started my agile journey. <laughs> so uh, what I, just a couple of the things that I learned was a positive attitude. Uh, one, you cannot go into an aerobics class and teach people how to dance around a room with a frown. That equates to you cannot lead ceremonies, you cannot be a product owner with grumpy pants on. That will not work, that will not get you uh, the people in the room to relate to you, and you will not be able to move forward with success. One of the other important things is buy-in and trust. Um, if you uh, don't get people to uh, come with you, as you can see, that was my normal um, outfit. If, if you can't get people to trust in you wearing that to dance around a room and put their feet together and uh, go in different directions, um, you're just going to have a mess. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, mm -hmm. um, faith in yourself, faith in your uh, ability to move forward and uh, getting people to believe in you. So you need that. Uh, the final part, 
is you have to have fun. If you're not having fun, why are you even bothering? Especially teaching aerobics. I mean, you've got crazy music, you got crazy outfits, you're dancing around with people in a room. Um, if you're not having fun, there's not much point in doing it. Same thing with any of your agile activities. Um, make it fun. Change up your retro, um, you know, have um, a, a crazy um, award. I used to do it for my teams. Um, I would have a um, virtual trophy for the best teammate of the iteration. And uh, they got to have it on Slack for however long it stayed in the general channel. Nice. Um, so <laughs> just, just make sure to uh, make, make it worth coming, <laughs> make it worth being with you for however long you are um, uh, being together as a unit. Um, so I put this to you. What parts of your life can you draw from? Where can you um, be the best that you can be and grow yourself as a person within your agile practice in whatever manner that you're doing it? If you're a product owner, if you're a developer, if you're uh, your scrum master, whatever that is. Um, so I challenge you to fill up that toolbox, see what's in it, maybe organize it, maybe not, but cheers to you. So thank you. Yay, thank you. That was super cool. Yeah, that was very cool. Appreciate it. Yeah. Wow. Have you given that before anywhere? Um, it, yeah, the original title was Everything I Learned to Be an Angelist. I Learned from Teaching Aerobics, which is not really inclusive to most everybody. So <laughs> trying to do a little better. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, well, thank you for stepping good. up. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Um, See, everybody, okay. it's not that scary. So. Great. Yep. You know, get it to nice yep. job. Five minutes timed. Um, did a great job. Appreciate it. Okay, so next, <laughs> um, I was just thinking early on before, when we first got on, Johanna, before you got on, Nicole's like, um, you know, wait, I'm gonna do a lightning speak, but Johanna's the speaker. <laughs> I'm like, she's allowing you to have, you know, <laughs> she's gonna share the, screen, the time. So we, we were chuckling about that. I'm like, heck yeah, this is great that you're doing a lightning speech and we're pretty excited about it, so. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. So I guess I'll just, um, I don't normally do a lot of introduction because I hope that that's what you do. Um, so I was just gonna say, no, you're known as the pragmatic manager um, and off, you offer the frank advice for your, the tough problems that people wanna solve. And I have to say that, yeah, that you're the author of 18 books because I think that is so flipping cold. So author of 18 books about many aspects of product development. And I know you'll say that in your own bio but I just thought that was cool I had to say it. So, Welcome, and we're really excited to have you. Well, thank you. I'm, as you can see by my um, moving windows and stuff around, I suspect that you saw saw a lot of that um, mousing and stuff. Um, I, I believe I finally have everything organized the way I want it to be organized. So um, I wrote these three books, uh, practical the, the Modern Management Made Easy books. Practical Ways to Manage Yourself, Practical Ways to Lead and Serve, Manage Others, and Practical Ways to Lead an Innovative Organization. And I wrote these books um, actually when I was trying to finish them and get them all to done, I decided I was a little bit of a masochist. But I, I had, um, I've gotten the writing bug. I am not a natural writer, whatever that is. Um, I'm not a natural anything except a person. And I have all these, what, what I'm going to share with you tonight is based on my personal experience, which means you might have a different experience. And what, I, what I'm talking about is how do we focus on the team, not individuals? Um, what I find is that so many people are still focused on individuals and not on that cross-functional team. And by the way, Nancy, those um, those Jeopardy questions, old, old, old version of the Scrum Guide. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so 
when you think about leadership, I like to think about leadership as serving the team, not individuals. Um, I People often say to me, leadership is about being out in front where people will follow you. Sometimes it's being out in front. Sometimes it's being off to the side. Sometimes it's being in the back so that you are stepping back from what the team is doing. But it's all about the team, not the individuals on the team. So I want to talk about... Um, the case for flow efficiency. We are we normally discuss resource efficiency. One person takes an item, they work on it, then they hand it off to the next person, they hand they work on it, they hand it off to the next person, they work on it, et cetera, et cetera. You finally get the outcome, the finished work at the end. But if we think about what an agile team is supposed to do, agile teams are supposed to work in flow efficiency. It turns out this is the fastest way to create valuable outcomes. Otherwise, you have the UI person did some stuff, the architect did some stuff, the tester did some stuff, the developers did some stuff, but you don't have a finished piece of functionality. When you focus on the work flowing through the team, as opposed to what people do in the team, you have faster outcomes you have fewer delays, you have increased team, team learning, and you make agility easier. This is the big, big problem for leadership in an agile organization because our organizations are based on resource efficiency. What is this person doing? What is that person doing? What is this other person doing? And not in flow efficiency, what does a team accomplish? So I'm going to talk through some of the issues here, um, which, of course, the that's the big question. How do we switch the focus? Now, for me, I think that this is where you create an environment where everybody can lead. So instead of having a designated leader, um, and I'm I'm still, I really happen to find titles useful. Um, I. Somebody asked me uh, recently, do, you, do I want to do away with management? And I said, no, because managers create and refine the culture for the, for the team, for the groups, for the entire organization. But I find that if I don't have to do as a manager, if I don't have to do all of the, the various kinds of legwork, I find that I can create an environment where everybody else can lead when it's their turn. So let me talk a little bit about Lumen's equation. That's behavior is a function of the person and their environment. So I am sure you have seen uh, performance problems, right? Somebody has to write somebody up. Um, somebody has to give uh, uh, change focus feedback to a person on the team. Often, that not all the time, but often team problems, right, performance problems arise from the environment. So let's take all of this together. How does the team work um, separately or together? Does the team, um, does anybody on the team pair? Do they swarm, do they mob? How do they collaborate? Or are they all individual um, working? How safe are the people on the team to discuss their concerns and challenges? I'm not talking about um, any any safety regarding, I, I cannot be on this call right now because I have to take a dog to the vet, right? People, A lot of people and teams understand that. But if I don't like, so maybe Marie says, I don't like your, your architecture, Johanna. I don't like your design. Can she offer me that feedback and explain why? Or have I, um, have I created an environment where she is not quite happy with telling me almost anything, right? That's the psychological safety that we need to have. Um, 
how do people use their various locations, their remote workspaces now, their physical locations, whenever we get back to the office, which we will at some point? How much trust do team members offer each other? And how do the organization policies and procedures help or hinder the team to perform their work? If you think about all of this for the person and their environment, you will understand their behavior a lot more easily. Turns out environment is all about the culture. So let me talk a little bit about um, Edgar Schein's ideas of culture. He talks about values, artifacts, and assumptions, which I don't actually understand all that well. But if you think about the three big pieces of that, it's what people can discuss, how people treat each other, and what the organization rewards. So imagine you have uh, a six-person cross-functional team. Um, actually, the research shows that nine people is too big and six or seven people is a pretty sweet spot. Four or five is often very effective for getting faster delivery of finished work, which I find very interesting. Oh, and Larry Macaroni, um, Macaron, however he says his last name, actually has some data that teams, teams of 14 or 15 are not any slower than teams of nine. When I asked him about that um, and said, what, what about teams of, of four or five or those faster? He said, I didn't do any research about that. So my experience, not research, says that teams of five or six people are the fastest, have the fastest throughput. Teams of nine to 15 people might not have any difference in throughput, but uh, I'm not sure how to create a team of that many people. So contrast a team of five or six people with two teams of three, because I bet you've seen this. The team of six people separates often into developers and everybody else, right? So there's a couple of testers and a UI person, three developers. And what happens? The developers talk with each other. The other people talk with each other. It's not a team. And if you have resource efficiency, that's all about individuals. So think about how your organization rewards people for their work or does not reward people for their work. And all of work is how do we treat each, each other, not just the actual technical work. So this is, I find this, this view of culture really changes how I think about a lot of teams. So I wanna talk about um, these ideas, which is about how can we define a team's value how can we do team-based leadership? How can we create an environment where people can succeed? And how you might have to stand up for your team. So the first one is defining the team's value. So I like to say, what value does a team offer the organization? If you have a feature team, a product team, a service team, what, what product or service does this team either create or support? That's a really good way to think about the value that the team offers. Now, define an overarching goal that aligns with that product or service. That overarching goal focuses people on outcomes. And then you can, at some point, move from only individual goals to partly team-based goals and compensation. Because what I see a lot in agile organizations is they they're still um, they're still compensating people on their work, but we want people to work as a team. And so I am not saying get rid of anybody's individual compensation. No, no, no. People still need specific individual compensation. However, if we make part of the compensation about how we facilitate and support each other, that would be more towards team-based compensation, at least team-based goals. So that's, when I think about that, that's all about the team's value. Now, 
what is the overarching goal? Because I've talked about this. I, if I, if I can tell you I have a, any client that uses OKRs well, I would tell you that. However, even the people who appear to have created OKRs, I don't think they're using OKRs all that well. I have not worked for all the teams at Google, but I have worked for some teams at Google. And so far, the way they do OKRs is not about an overarching goal. It's about how people can show their value to the organization, their personal value to the organization. That's, that's not an overarching goal. So if you have a team, what outcomes does this team need to offer? If you think about outcomes as opposed to outputs, you might be in a very good place. I, I really like to avoid those kinds of interim milestones, complete by date, whatever. Um, I'm sure that some of you still have kind of those goals for, uh, for either you or your team. That's, it might be what you need to do right, right now, but I, I find that those are, if they are outcomes, then that's very helpful for the customers, the people who buy the product, all that stuff. But often they are outputs. So I really like to focus on what customers can do with a product or service. Um, I often say customers can solve this problem by this date. That's an overarching goal. If you have not looked up um, Goico Edgex impact mapping and used it, you might find that impact mapping really helps the product owner um, understand the overarching goal for the product, um, senior leadership to define the overarching goal for the strategy. Um, if you are a functional manager and you have a functional team or you have a product team, you might use impact mapping for that. That's, I have found this to be a really good way of thinking about goals that are larger than ship this thing by the state. Because ship this thing by the state might be what we need to do. But I often discover that if we can talk about the goal that supports that need, we are better off. So defining the overarching goal, I think, is a really good idea. Now, and that when when people can when people have this overarching goal they can coalesce around that goal so they can learn together i've been doing a lot of work with feedback loops um, inside in teams and at the portfolio level and even for the strategy and i find that when when we reduce the the duration of the feedback loop that's often because the team is working together. They are learning together. So I have found also that when teams focus on technical excellence, as opposed to, um, we'll just do this thing over here, we'll copy and paste from there to there, um, that's often not a useful approach because you take the old defects, you copy and paste them into new code. So I really like teams that can chuck themselves as they proceed. So that gets them faster finishing, right? So if the team works together and they pay attention to technical excellence, they will have a much easier time and they will create much faster throughput of all their work. So I really like to, to talk about the goal and say, if we have this goal, what's the first thing we need to learn? What kind of an experiment do we want to, co to coalesce around this goal? How can we use the goal to drive our next set of work and the learning to drive our next set of work? So let me talk a little bit uh, now about team-based leadership and what that might mean. So I suspect that a lot of you are, are working in organizations where the manager is supposed to offer feedback and coaching to the people on the team. But if the team is supposed to work together, they need to offer feedback and coaching to each other. So I really like to, in a one-on-one, -on -one, teach 
feedback and coaching. That's via meta feedback and meta coaching. I also like to um, support team leaders in offering feedback and, and coaching labs. So I, I have a 30 minute um, simulation exercise activity that I teach managers and other team leaders so that they can actually teach feedback and coaching. If people offer labs during work hours on how to offer feedback and coaching, people can practice with each other. They don't have to practice on literally exactly the same stuff that they work on all the time. But the more they practice with each other, the more likely they are to be able to offer feedback and coaching to each other. I have found this really helpful for dispersing leadership inside the teams and for helping to create an, an environment where everybody can lead. So let me talk about feedback. Feedback is about observable behavior. So I like to think of peer-to-peer -peer feedback, right? Not um, teacher-student feedback, not parent-child feedback, peer-to-peer. -peer. We are all adults in the organization. Let's treat people like adults. Well, unless I'm, you know, a juvenile, but every so often I am. So that the kind of peer-to-peer -peer feedback I really like is what Esther and I wrote in Behind Closed Doors, Secrets of Great Management. Create an opening to make sure that this is a good time for feedback. Describe the behavior or the results. State the impact and then make a request. Now, let me give you a little tip here. The best kind of feedback is when people receive reinforcing feedback. We often think about feedback as change focused, but if we think about reinforcing feedback, I might say, um, and I'm gonna use Nancy or Marie here because I, I feel like I know them, right? Uh, so Nancy, I, I really like the way you ran the Jeopardy thing today, even though the answers were a little you know old. But you got people involved. You got you made a great um, a great feeling at the start of this meeting. I think that people really appreciated a little bit of fun to start off the meeting. So, Nancy, I should not have said even though the answers were old. Yeah, I'm I'm not very good at editing myself in in the moment. Sorry. However, Nancy might then say, "Oh, so she liked it. That's good. I should do that again." Um, now, notice that I did include um, something that could be improved, which is not about Nancy's behavior. That was about the data that Nancy had. So I might actually say to her, um, do you want me to find a more, a more um, up-to-date Jeopardy that would be um, English and not old? <laughs> and, or she might say, I'll do it. Right, because you guys are into the the icebreaker things, and I and she and that would be it, right? It's not about giving her feedback that you know something was wrong. It was this little tiny thing, but I gave her reinforcing feedback so to have more fun at the beginning, especially when we're remote. It's really hard for people to have the same kind of fun that we had back when we were together. So. Um, I'm not sure when we will ever be back together. I do not have a crystal ball, but in including fun in our work, this is a really big deal. So reinforcing feedback, it turns out, is something like nine times more effective than change-focused feedback. And what do we do in the organization? We focus on change-focused feedback. So uh, one of my bosses um, many, many years ago said to me, Johanna, you're too blunt and direct. Yeah, I am. You know, what am I going to do about that? I did not get any value from that feedback. But when somebody else said to me, when you, when you call people stupid, bad, or wrong, they tend not to listen to you. Okay, I can change my words, right? So... Giving specific observations and helping me figure out what I could do differently, that was really useful feedback. In fact, a boss 
ages and ages ago um, told me I, I didn't finish things. I got to 96%, 97%. I didn't get it over the goal line, as he used to say. And then he gave me specific instances. I now create checklists for myself. So Marie, when you said I, I've written 18 books, I got checklists for these books, right? I don't do this alone. I have my, my valuable checklist because otherwise I would not finish a thing. So we need feedback, but we also need, rein we need reinforcing feedback to know what we're doing really, really well. So um, when I think about coaching and meta coaching, a lot of times, I, I don't know how many of you are, are considered coaches in the organization. However, I think I, I see a lot of other kinds of work other than coaching. I like to think about coaching as offering options with support, right? Not teaching people and there's other stances in coaching. But if you can create an environment where everybody coaches everybody else and without inflicting help, this is really good. I am actually excellent at inflicting help. So I don't know how many of you have ever been in a situation like this. Somebody says to you, can I talk to you for a few minutes? And you say, sure. And they say, I got this problem, blah, 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 blah. And you, if you're like me and you don't, manage to stop your mouth, you say, oh, I know how to fix that. That's inflicting help. So what I have learned how to do is to say, oh, would you like me to offer you suggestions? And often, especially if it's my kids, they say, no, I just want you to listen. Okay. So not inflicting help is a really big piece of coaching. And when you, when people ask you for help, then you can offer options. But it's almost, it's sometimes more valuable for people to go through the exercise of thinking about their options. And sometimes it's more valuable for you to walk through options with them. So there is no one right or wrong answer here, but understanding which position you're taking, which stance you're taking for coaching, that really helps. Because if everybody can coach each other, you as the leader for the team do not have to be in the middle of the work. You can do something else, which is probably even more valuable for the organization. Now, if you are a manager, you must do regular one-on-ones. I, I happen to like every week or two, um, depending on the kind of work you do. Uh, I have not seen that once a month one-on-ones is, is uh, short enough frequency. It's just not enough time to build that relationship. Because a one-on-one -on -one is about a trusting relationship. You learn what each person wants or needs from the organization, from the work, in their team. You get to, um, to check in on the career development. You get to listen for bad news. So I often, in my one-on-ones back at, when I was a manager, I, I asked for um, what what bad news should I hear, right? What do you know that I should hear? And people would tell me horrible stuff. I also asked for rumors. I am um, a little oblivious sometimes, right? Uh, and I'm not I'm not very good at being plugged into the rumor mill. And especially as a manager, I find that managers are often outside the rumor mill. So scrum masters, coaches, you are probably inside the rumor mill. You hear things, but managers often do not. So if you look for bad news, if you get the signal, if you ask for rumors, you are much more able to do better work as a manager. So um, now this is a really big problem. I don't know how many of you move from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting every day. I suspect almost all of you do. So you will have to protect your schedule, especially since we are still remote, because it's not possible to keep those regular one-on-one -on -one times. Um, I hope that you know about Paul Graham's essay called Maker schedule, manager schedule. 
and makers need large chunks of work where they can um, focus and think. Managers, by their very definition, multitask all the time. So if you have good one-on-one -on -one times with the people that you lead and serve, you will need to figure out how to protect those one-on-one -on -one times because somebody will want to take that time over. I guarantee it. So uh, protecting your schedule is a very, very big deal. Now, here are a couple of different structures for one-on-ones. Uh, and let me, and I will put this in the slides. You'll have this later. But let me offer you a minimal one-on-one -on -one structure. I really like a check-in. Um, I, I happen to like a one-word check-in, which is happy, cold. <laughs> I happen to be both of those today. You can tell by my, my, uh, my scarf. Um, and maybe concerned, right? I'm, I might be concerned about something in, in my work environment for anywhere else. How do I, but a check-in that's brief enough so we can connect with each other as humans that's a really good thing. Now, the next question I, I often use is, do you need anything? Now, this is not just from me. This is anything at all, right? So if I just ask, do you need anything? Or what do you need? Sometimes I say, what do you need? And that's uh, another open-ended question. And then I can ask, is anything getting in your way? And then I can ask, what can I, as your manager, do to help? Notice I am not inflicting help here yet. Now, I I happen to find this minimal one-on-one -on -one structure pretty useful. You can also have an even more minimal one-on-one -on -one structure, where if you're the manager, you say, please make an agenda for our one-on-one -on -one and let me know what it is a day in advance. That's where the other person has the responsibility to create a one-on-one. -on -one. Now, if, if that person says on a regular basis, uh, I don't have anything, we can cancel the one-on-one. -on -one. No, 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 don't do that. Either move, either use this structure or one of these structures, but not do not let anybody cancel a one-on-one. -on -one. Not um, a manager, not the person. But think about how can you get to the point where the person is leading you as the manager to, to a good one-on-one -on -one structure? Now, what's interesting about um, regular one-on-ones is you can offer um, frequent reinforcing feedback. You can learn a whole lot more about the team's environment. You can see signals that help you understand the team systems and, and system and environment. And you don't have to then have performance reviews. Now, we have 25 years of, of data, 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 that says performance reviews don't work. They don't happen frequently enough. We mess up uh, the feedback with, with the actual money. Um, we don't, we give people short-term goals which have often, which are useless often within a month or two, if not earlier of the time that we do the performance review. We rank people, which is silly if we want them to work as teams. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that's just broken about the way we do um, performance reviews. And the worst part is that performance reviews are all about evaluation. And that's about managing money, not performance. So let me tell you a little story about one of my um, early evaluations. Um, at my very first job, I got an exceeds expectations in every dimension. I was very, very proud of myself. And I got a monstrous raise, 15%. This is, this is back in the 70s when we got monstrous raises. Okay. So... I got this big, big raise. I was very happy at lunchtime with my colleagues. I said I really got, I was really happy with my performance review. I got a nice big raise. A colleague of mine, a guy, said, Oh, I didn't. He said, He asked how much, what percentage was your raise? I said, 15%. He said, I only got 
Oh, okay. And then he told me what he made. With his 10% raise, he was still making $3,000 a year more than I was with my 15% monstrous raise. What happened? I, I, of course, made an appointment to talk to with my boss right after lunch. I walked in and said, what happened? He said, well, we offered the women who graduated from college less than the men last year. You were one of those women. And I said, even though I had a BS in computer science and relevant experience, and he didn't, yes, even though, um, 70s, yeah, pay parity was um, not, not, in, in, not in the culture anywhere at all yet. So I said, I want to raise, so I'm even with him. He said, I maxed out your raise. I can't give you a larger raise. I said, you gave him a raise. Why can't I get a bigger raise? I deserve it. You said I exceeded expectations. You didn't say he exceeded all the expectations. I was more valuable than he was. This is the problem. This is another problem with um with individual uh, rewards. So, um, my boss said I have to wait a full year before I can do anything for you. So I said, okay, I'm going to go get a new job for more money. He said, really. You're going to leave us? I said, yeah. You can't pay me what I'm worth. I want to leave you. This is the problem with evaluations and ranking people, right? Um, and right now, we don't have, um, maybe I should knock on wood, we don't have much inflation at all. I think we have no inflation, actually. So all of these evaluations are based on, you know, everyone's going to get between 1% and 3% in their pay. And maybe they will get more if they have profit sharing. But the idea is you're going to really try and figure out what it, what it exceeds expectations or meet, meets expectations means for one to two or three percent. I mean, that's just kind of craziness. So uh, when I when I get to this part, I'd like to take a break because I need to take some water. Any questions about this? If you have the questions right now, you might as well just go on for, oh, actually, we do have a question in chat. Yeah. Um, so this is from Lenny. Lenny, why don't you just ask your question? Go off mute. Yeah, I can come off mute. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Joanna, it's good to see you again. Um, so you started the, your talk with, um, with the, the statement to focus on the team. And yep. now you've gotten down into the individual level with the one-on-one -on -one and, and the manager here. Yep. Uh, how do you bring those two roles, team and individual, together cohesively? So what I do as a manager is to say, your job, person, is to support the team, which is why I don't want to do performance reviews, and I certainly don't want to do evaluations. Right. If I if I say er, everybody's senior, your job is to bring everybody's um, learning up and we will have we will have partially individual compensation because the team always knows who is doing what. The team absolutely knows who is most valuable or what's often the case is more valuable in this area and more valuable in that area. Right. So. I, I find that this business of just valuable doesn't talk enough about how we all have to work as colleagues to finish the work. So I, um, in a perfect world, so let me just say, I've been working for 25 years as a consultant. Nobody has given me a performance review in 25 years. I have gotten hmm. plenty of feedback. Some of it I, I treasure and some of it I treasure, right, for different reasons. So I, the, the whole business of what kind of feedback is useful for a given person, that's really important. But um, I mean, what if, especially when, when, when we're trying to manage um, salary money in the organization, if you just say everybody gets a 2% raise, I mean, how how bad would that be? There are ungellers, there are people who are not competent. Those people don't get raises, 
right? And the team knows who they are. The team will tell you if you're a manager, who is not working, who is, um, who is making it even more difficult for people to work. But if we don't have if we don't have feedback more often, and Mike has a really interesting comment in the chat, the annual performance review is akin to one day each year scolding your dog for everything she or he did wrong for the entire year. Mike, that is priceless. If you have not blogged that somewhere, you should. I hope that you do. And then tell me when you do so I can retweet it or something. Right? That's... That's exactly the problem. I cut you off. You were going to say something. No, thank you for the encouragement. I'll find a place to get that out there. Okay. Tag me when you do, please. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so this is why we need one-on-ones and everybody needs feedback, right? I, I get feedback from, from people I teach, from my clients, from my colleagues, we won't talk about family feedback. Yeah, we. I get feedback from them too. But, and the one-on-one -on -one helps you see the team's environment, which is really important. But you can, if you start to, if you have regular one-on-ones, you don't have to have performance reviews or evaluations. Now, I'm not gonna talk in about HR. HR is a different problem. We can talk about that when I'm done with a formal presentation. Because this is, that's a whole, a whole huge deal. Okay, I think I got all the questions. So I said that there was change, focus, feedback, and reinforcing feedback. Um, and I, I think I actually did all this, all this all already. So, because yeah, I don't, I don't memorize what I'm going to say. Now let me talk about an environment where everybody can succeed. So I really like to think about collaboration over cooperation. So when people collaborate, they work together. I'm a huge fan of pairing, swarming, and mobbing, um, where we all work on one thing at a time, right? Um, pairs will work on one thing. Um, swarms work on one thing. Mobs work on one thing. They work differently. So I want to think about, um, instead of that, that very pretty forest up there that we have a stand of trees that collaborate together. That means we need to weed out the non-gellers or the people who really cannot do the work and the team knows who those people are. So I really like to hire for people who can work as part of a team. Um, you need to have sufficient cultural fit, not, um, and I'm gonna talk, I, I already talked about what people can um, what people can discuss, how they treat each other, and what we reward. But cultural fit is not the same as comfort. So I often work with organizations who do not share all of my values, and but I can fit enough of their culture that they can take some of what I offer and apply it to their environment. I also really like to hire for diversity of thought and experience. So if you can if you can hire people who are unique, who have different um, values, not just cultural values, but offer different technical and non-technical value to the given team, you will create an environment where everybody can succeed. And then if you... Um, if you offer reinforcing feedback so that people amp up the good work that they're doing, they will probably amp down the, the not so helpful work, right? So when, when people say to me, Johanna, I really understood that. That was a great example. And you didn't piss me off. <laughs> one, of, one of my clients actually said that. Um, that was a form of reinforcing feedback where he was able to tell me, um, I didn't, I didn't make him feel stupid, bad, or wrong. That was, thank goodness, much earlier in my consulting career. So I have been practicing that already. So um, I, I want you to think about the culture of, the, of any organization. I really like this quote. 
is shaped by the worst behavior the leader is willing to tolerate. I find that when we tolerate 10x, 10x people or uh, indispensable people, and we allow people to, um, to do things that harm, psychologically harm the rest of the team, that we are tolerating behavior that we should not tolerate. So I'm gonna, um, I wanna look at what Rob has said. Pre-COVID open, open workspaces help with feedback and leadership awareness to teams growth and, in, and enablement over time. Yeah, it's true that remote okay. is still possible. Um, and Curious George's one, two, twenty, and back again. I think that. Oh, okay. Um, so, I think that there is. I think that open workspace itself can help. However, I I I used to see a lot of open workspace where the people doing the work felt as if the managers, so the people doing the work were in bullpens and the managers were all on the outside in offices and the people um, in doing the work did not feel as if they had enough privacy to disagree with each other in public. If you ever seen teams where everybody has a headset on that's that's a sign that the open workspace is not working for them. Everybody needs a variety of workspaces, and the one of the great things about the uh, about this pandemic is that we are able to have privacy. Hopefully, you have privacy from the people in your home, but every every team has more privacy and can choose when to have which kind of privacy. I think it's really important to say, what does our team mean for its workspace? Okay, so the next, the last thing that um, I suggest that leaders do is to back up or support your team, especially to others. So one of the things I've seen is that. Um, the leader takes a vacation. I know when, when will we take vacations again? Or the leader is busy with something else uh, and the team makes a decision. If you say, whatever decision you make, I will support, then you, you must support the team. And if other people want to blame your team for something they, they did in a well-meaning way, you have to take the responsibility for that. This is, that's where the buck stops here is, it's kind of the, um, the Truman quote that I really, really like. I find that the more you can support your team, the more you back up your team, the more you are able, the more your team will work for you and to make you successful. So you are probably not in the middle of the work for your team, at least I hope you are not. But I think it's really important to say, how do we, how do we, how do I as a leader make it possible for the team to succeed? And this is why managing yourself is really the first key in any kind of management role. So I've given you a whole bunch of ideas here. So and you might say this is a lot of theory. Uh, all of this is practice that I have, um, that I practice. So I would like you to think about how you can experiment. What will you need to apply to your work? How will you engage yourself and your team? How can you realize the results that you need? And then choose where you will experiment and learn more. I am not asking you to change your beliefs at all. This is not about beliefs. This is about practicing new behaviors so you might change your beliefs later. So let me go back to this culture thing. If your organization rewards resource efficiency, then you will have trouble working in flow. Agile approaches want flow efficiency as the way to drive behaviors. So 
remember Lewin's equation that the person's um, performance is a function of the environment and, uh, no, the person's behaviors, sorry, is a function of the environment and their performance in that environment. We often behave to maximize our rewards and minimize punishment. So think about what does your organization do? Do they, do they focus on punishment? Do they focus on rewards? Sometimes organizations do some of both. So think about individual work where people are always busy, but not necessarily having the throughput that the team really needs to show. So I hope that you um, link with me on LinkedIn. I write an email newsletter called The Pragmatic Manager. And if you're interested in these books, they're all on my website and um, take a look at, at uh, modern, management, modern Management Made Easy. Yeah, it's easy for me to say. The bundle is only on sale at, at um, MeanPub. And I will stop the share now. And let's see what kind of other questions we have. Feel, feel free to um, unmute if you have a question and just skip the chat room. comments doesn't have to be a doesn't have to be a question either comments thoughts that was very very beautiful i was i was doing some multitasking at the at the start but then uh johanna actually dragged me to stop my other works and then put me my mind here it was, <laughs> it was so beautiful and then there are a few things that i wanted to do for an example, the feedback and one-on-one -on -one sessions that Johanna has mentioned about, it was very clear what uh, I can go ahead with that. It was awesome. Oh, thank you. That's so, that's wonderful. I'm so glad I dragged you back in. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Johanna. Thank you. A good share. Thank you. Um. Joanna, I just have a quick question. Do we, do, are you going to share the slides? Oh, sure. Not? Yeah. Um, I, th I think that they're on speaker deck, although I'm, I'm pretty sure I keep changing the slides a little. So yes, I will, I will make sure they're on speaker deck and I will, I will send you a link to them. Sounds good. Yeah. So then I'll send it because I'm, I'm looking forward to like sitting down with it and digesting it. Like, cause yeah. it's a lot of information and it was really a lot of good information. And I'm at a place right now where I need this information. So um, I thought if I get the slides, I don't remember what you said. I know where you live now. So I'll be, <laughs> I <make sure> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but, but no, that's, it's, it's, it was a great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Well, I see that Andrew came off of mute. Yeah. And thank yeah, you. it's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was uh, reflecting on that last slide about uh, the resource efficiency versus flow efficiency. And it's really such a big mindset shift for an organization and, and for the people in the organization. And I'm curious uh, you know, what thoughts you have around helping that mindset shift take place. Okay, so as a consultant, I can probably say things you might not be able to say. Okay. Let, I mean, no, sure. seriously. No, I get it. I so, get it. I've been, I've yeah. been the consultant where uh, yeah, yeah, you, you have a different kind of credibility than the people inside the organization. So yes, I get it. Go ahead. Yeah. So what I, what I often hear is that HR makes us do this. Okay. So when I go to HR and I say, um, I realize that you want to manage the salary costs in the organization, right? This is, this is a huge, huge thing. Man managing salary costs in software organizations, almost all the cost is salary, right? All the, um, there's, there's equipment and space costs that are fixed, but salary tends to grow every year. So we really need to manage salary costs. So I say, I understand you want to do this. And are you aware of all this research that talks about performance management as disengagement and the performance, excuse me, that performance reviews don't work. Are you aware of that? And they might say, no, 
because SHRM, SHRM, talks about all this stuff all the time. They are in, HR is in this, this system that says we must do this and we must make that process agile. In fact, they still think that manager-led feedback and coaching is the right way to do it. They don't understand that in, in an agile environment, we really want um, peers to offer each other feedback and coaching. So the first thing I do is offer them information. And then I, I tend to go through this, this kind of a um, process. I said, are you willing to consider an experiment where we gave everybody a cost of living raise because we need to do that. And we, we set aside some portion of the raises so that the teams can decide what to do. And the teams might say, everybody gets the same amount and the teams might not. Are you willing to consider that an, an experiment? Maybe, um, especially if it's 2% or something, right? Give everybody the 1% and then it's, it's a small amount of money, right? You're not talking about thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, uh, and if they're willing to consider it, but with less money, now we have the basis, we can have a hypothesis. Sorry, we run an experiment. We can, we can see what happens. And uh, especially HR, a lot of HR is all about measuring um, happiness. I think happiness is the most stupid metric I have ever seen. Satis, people want to work for satisfaction. People don't work for happiness. My happiness is a function of whether or not my husband had a good bike ride and whether or not I finished my writing for the day. It's not my satisfaction with the work I did, right? We were, if we can be satisfied with our work, we will create our own happiness regardless of what's happening in our lives. But people work for satisfaction and mutual respect inside the organization. So let's focus on that. Um, so I, I, I start there and, and walk through the thought experiment and then say, what's the smallest thing we could do? Oh yeah, a fulfillment. For me, that's satisfaction, but maybe a fulfillment is, in, is an even better word. Yeah. So I think, it's, I think it's really important to say, how can we separate the performance review and evaluation stuff from how we reinforce flow efficiency in, in the organization. And in book three, I talk about managers need to work on flow efficiency. That if you give managers, um, if you ask managers to work as cohorts, right? We talk about the senior leadership team. We talk about feature and product teams. What happened to all the managers in the middle? They're not job liver, right? The first level managers need to work together. The middle managers we need to work together. Senior managers need to work together. So if we if we ask the managers to work together, and maybe we we ask the managers to do this first with their pay. That's I have actually had a fair amount of traction with that, because the managers want an overarching goal. They don't want to work against each other. That's great. There is Thank no you. one right way. Yeah. Oh. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, as you you had come off mute before. Yeah. Yes, uh, I'll start with some reinforcing uh, feedback. It was a great talk. Thank you. Definitely a food for thought. Um, I want to go back to what you said about the OKRs. You mentioned that you haven't seen it implemented well. And have you tried with, with your... Um, with your clients or customers or the, the you know, where, where you were working to, to make it better and what was the result? Um, they have always told me, we, we don't want your help on that, Johanna. So I have not, because um, one, one of the cardinal rules as a consultant is only do what the client pays you for. Otherwise you're inflicting help and you're not, um, they don't appreciate it. So. I have, I have said to some of my clients, uh, I have seen better results with, um, with a different approach. Let me know if you would like to address that. 
so far nobody has said that so yeah yep yep thank you thank you mike oh yeah five positive interactions needed to neutralize one negative interaction um i think it's i think it's covey that talks about the trust bank mm -hmm. yeah it just when when you were talking about the nine times more effective reinforcing feedback it brought me back to this and it seems like there's a correlation there yep yep Other Anybody questions else? or comments? Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe I can ask another question. Uh, so what do you think of teams who are, um, you know, much stronger for their own management uh, or much stronger than the traditional management themselves? For example, I think Netflix does that or Google doesn't hire really uh, uh, the tr traditional managers where, uh, for example, in Netflix, they can even decide who to fire. Uh, because that person is not pulling their weight, for example. So, um, so the team decides, right? Right. So I, I actually, th so the team always knows, I know I've said this several times, but the team always, always, always knows. Um, and the manager might, might not know. So um, I, I happen to think that um, having the team make these decisions i'm i'm a huge fan of the team make the hiring decision so any manager mm -hmm. who overrides the team uh i made that mistake once i did not need to make that mistake again so yeah that was early in my management career however i and if the team can hire why can't the team fire if the team has is equipped with the knowledge of how to offer each other feedback, how to offer each other coaching. If somebody needs training, then you say, um, this person needs training, right? So don't, don't just um, irrationally fire. But a lot of people don't have the interpersonal skills. And if the team can can do something about those interpersonal skills themselves. And then they say, you know, we give up. This person might be a great developer or tester or whatever, but he or she is so hard to work with, it's not worth the aggravation. Why should the team have to wait for a manager? I'm, I think it's an excellent idea. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Now's your chance. <laughs> okay. Well, in the interest of time then, um, I'd like to say thank you all for coming. Johanna, this has been a great presentation. Thank you for joining us again. Just love having you here. We'll, we'll be bugging you again, I'm sure, about something else. <laughs> like, please join us again. We love seeing you. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I really love being here. And Nancy and Marie, thank you so much for asking me. And, and thank you for, um, for letting me do this. I, ha I had a blast. Thank you all for being here. Very cool. Uh, Johanna, I have a favor to ask of you. Can yeah. you stay on for a couple minutes after everybody leaves? Oh, sure, sure. I'd love yeah. to chat with you about something different. Oh, but um, yeah, so when you send out your slides, can you also send out the links? Or maybe I have them. You know, you have some really cool blogs and articles and stuff. Um, I, I signed up for your pragmatic manager email. Oh, um, good, thank you. So, so yeah, so I just think it'd be really, it's it, they're great resources. So I'll make sure that I send this out to the team for those people that are interested. I thought it was good. Stuff. I will, thank you. Thank so, you, yeah. I will. Yeah, so, okay, I'm just gonna look at the chat just in case everybody's just saying good night kind of thing and thank you, so. Yeah. Lots of thank yous, so yeah, that was great. Nice, yeah, yeah, it was really thank enjoyable. You. Thank you all for being here. Have a great thank night. You.